welcome to Polar Bears International Tundra Connections. Coming to you live from the tundra, where we've got polar bears right outside our windows. I'm Don Moore from Smithsonian's National Zoo and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in the United States. And with me today are Cassie Siegel and Dr. Andrew DeRoche. And we're going to talk about polar bears as a pop culture icon. Um, what do bears, specifically polar bears, mean to humans and especially to you? Our audience is anyone and everyone across the world. Our partner on today's program is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and Explore.org. The program is going to last about 40 minutes, including time for questions and answers. Please enter your questions in the chat window, email us at questions at pbears.org, or tweet at polar bears, or use hashtag tundra connections. We'll also talk about how you can help polar bears and the climate. We'd love to hear about what all of you are doing to reduce your carbon footprint. Let's talk for a minute about exactly what an icon is. If you look up the definition of an icon, it's something that represents something else. So, for instance, a, a bear in popular culture would be a Chicago bear, you know, an icon for the sports team. Or for the National Zoo, it's the giant panda, which of course, they're very, very cute bears, but that's also an icon for the relations between the country of China and the country of the United States of America. It, it represented peace between the two countries, and it was a gift between China and the United States back in the 1970s, and it carries on that icon status today. So, um, bears are important. We've had them in culture for a long time, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'd like to talk to our two panelists, Cassie and, and Dr. DeRoche, and ask them uh, to introduce themselves and also to say something about uh, what bears mean to them. So, Cassie Siegel, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how bears have had an influence on your life? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Cassie Siegel. I'm an environmental lawyer. I work for the Center for Biological Diversity, and I'm so excited to be up here this week with Polar Bears International in this buggy with polar bears walking all around um, outside of the buggy right now. And bears have um, always had a very special place in my life, probably like a lot of you. I had a teddy bear as a kid, and that's one of my earliest memory memories is getting that teddy bear and I still have it to this day and love it very much and um, never actually knew that I would end up spending so much of my career working on polar bears uh, but that's been very special. That's great thank you. Andy what about you? Well um, I'm Andy DeRoche I'm a professor at the University of Alberta and, and it's kind of fun because of course we have uh, the men's teams and the women's teams there for sports and we've got the golden bears for the men's and the and the pandas for for the women so that's a pretty good example from the University of Alberta but I've been studying polar bears across the Arctic uh, for the last 30 years um, and it and it's pretty neat I mean I got hooked into bears at an early age. I grew up on the west coast of Canada and, and actually the first bears I ever saw were black bears and I remember that really pretty much to this day it was a mother with three little cubs on the side of the road and I wanted to get out there and hang out with these little bear cubs and of course my dad said well, you can't go out there it's dangerous you know the mother bears there and I was like oh, okay and I actually got started on bears working on grizzly bears and I'm kind of an accidental polar bear scientist. I, um, I didn't plan on it. The first bears I ever saw were actually in a zoo um, and so it, the first polar bears were in a zoo and so you know you, you look at it and everywhere I go in the world now it, it's amazing you know you see polar bears everywhere they're just in every shop window I don't know how many you know I was just uh, down in in uh, Ottawa our, our nation's capital and you walk down some of the streets there and it's like polar bears in a snowstorm you can buy it as an apron you can buy it as a t-shirt you know it's just there's the bears are everywhere in our culture. There's lots of good That's reasons great. for it. And, and you know, one of the reasons why I think people really relate to bears is in ecology we talk about an ecological niche. It's like a yes. space where an organism lives. And if it doesn't matter if you're looking at polar bears in this environment or black bears where you live or grizzly bears or pandas, there's a lot of overlap in the resources that the bears use and what people use. So. It's, it's because we actually compete a bit for space and for resources, I think we can relate to them a, a lot. So no matter where you are, it could be South America, there's a very strong bond between P 
people and bears. It permeates our our culture, our myths, our you know our our uh, fables as well. You know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You go there. It's always about bears. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can spend a little bit of time on kind of the different species of bears. I'd like to go back to Cassie's comment about uh, teddy bears and. My first bears were also uh, American black bears in the Northeast, and they're fascinating bears. You know, um, to Dr. DeRoche's comments, I think we're, we're fascinated by bears because they stand up like we do, they look around like we do, they're smart like we are, they're long live like we are. The mom, you know, is walking around with her two cubs, kind of like an American human or a human family group. And uh, so just a couple of those black bears. Let me tell you about uh, Winnie the Pooh. Back in the early 1900s, there was a black bear in uh, Winnipeg, on t uh, Manitoba, Canada. And it was adopted by apparently a Royal Canadian Air Force flyer. And he took the little bear over with him to uh, fly in Europe in World War I. The bear got too big to be a mascot for the Air Force anymore, and it was put into the London Zoo, where a guy named A.A. A. Milne was taking his son Robin uh, to the zoo, and so Winnie the Pooh was born as a story. The other story is about teddy bears, and our U.S. President, Theodore Roosevelt, was out west in 1902 and there was a bear that uh, apparently some hunters had had stunned it had tied it to a tree and Teddy Roosevelt was a great sportsman and they said Mr. President why don't you shoot this bear and he said I'm not going to shoot that bear that's not sportsmanlike and so everybody learned about that story and uh, a man in in New York City had his wife sew a bear and they asked President Roosevelt if they could call it a teddy bear after him. And so the stuffed teddy bear was born. And of course, now we call them teddy bears and everybody's forgotten that story. But uh, the original teddy bear that was sewn in 1903 was given to the Smithsonian Institution in 1963 and is in great condition and is still in our Smithsonian Museum. There are three million objects in the museum. Might be hard to find that one, but uh, if you look hard, you can find, you know, Dorothy's ruby slippers from the Wizard of Oz, as well as uh, the original teddy bear. There are lots of things there. So um, a couple of others. Um, Andy talked about Goldilocks and the three bears. We think that was probably uh, a European brown bear story, maybe. Uh, Paddington bear uh, was actually an Andean bear, a spectacled bear. Um, and there are other other stories of bears in culture. Um, Yogi Bear uh, is a cartoon. They were probably grizzly bears because they were Western bears. And we have we just have a lot of bears in culture. Um, Baloo the bear. We were talking about Baloo the bear the other night, and apparently Baloo is just a word that means bear. So it could have yeah. been any of the Indian bears. Is that right? Well, I, I mean, I always thought it was probably a sloth bear. Me but too. But just, uh, you know, you look at Baloo on that picture, and you know, I'm not really sure, okay, well, it's kind of a goofy bear, but, I mean, everybody recognizes that image, you know. But, you know, it kind of brings a lot of the personalities that you sort of associate with bears are sort of happy-go-lucky, and, you know, this one is upright and goofing around, and, you know, there, there's sort of this, this image of this good-natured sort of organism, and we sort of... Uh, you know, you look at this sleeping polar bear outside and the snow is falling and you sort of think it looks so peaceful and beautiful. But I think, you know, it's, there's sort of something, there's a fascination here because you also know that they're dangerous. And so, as I've often thought, you know, you look at a bear like this, it's just beautiful to look at, but it's also has that, you have that little freeze on of fear when you see them. Yeah. I don't want to be down where they are. And I think it's just sort of this idea that they're probably the original Beauty and the Beast. You know, they're beautiful to look at, but a little scary. So it's kind of like, you know, it's you're kind of drawn to them, but also repelled. And it's that push and pull towards them that I think fascinates us with bears, just worldwide. Yeah. Well, and our history, our human history with bears has been very, very long. There are bear clans and things like that. Maybe you could 
uh, talk about our, our history with polar bears specifically? Well, of course, uh, the, the deepest part of the history, and it's not really pop culture, but of course is Inuit people in the north, so or Eskimos in parts of the world where they still prefer to that, that the older name. Um, but they live very closely with, with bears, and you can go back, and, and some of the archaeological digs, what you find is they don't have big artwork, but they would have little small amulets, like good luck charms, and they were very often carved like polar bears. Um, today, we still see polar bears uh, used in a lot of Inuit art, from the dancing bears to uh, print work, all sorts Lord. of things. You, you see lots of polar bears uh, in the imagery, and it's, it's partly because polar bears hold a very special place in Inuit culture. Um, they are very big in sort of the social fabric of these communities. They still hunt them and still eat them in many places. There's also an economic element uh, that is tied to polar bears as well, of course, because we still harvest polar bears in many parts of the, the world, and, and their pelts are sold uh, by northern people as well. So again, you know, they have this very close bond with the species, uh, but it, it really um, has been a global phenomenon. If you ask people what, what species they want to see, polar bears end up in the top ten all the time. Lions, yeah. tigers, polar bears. I'd, I'd start with polar bears, but anyways. And so, coming through time, as European men came to the North American continent and even went north uh, on the European continent, how have polar bears kind of transitioned from being these cultural icons for, for primitive people into kind of pop culture icons for modern times? Well, it, it's kind of cool because polar bears were always hip, so to speak, you know. Yeah. Um, if you go back 1252, there was uh, King Haakon III in Norway. So he was the king of Norway at the time. Uh, he gave a polar bear to King Henry III, and that polar bear was actually kept in the Tower of London, right on the banks of the Thames, and they would take that bear down to swim around uh, in the river. They probably had it on a big rope or a chain or something, so they could probably get it back. Uh, but it was it was viewed as a prized possession. The Tower of London was actually a big zoo, basically, one of the very earliest ones. So they had giraffes and hippos in there and other things. Um, so, you know, right back to those times, this was a species that was prized, very highly prized. Um, and one of the one of the neat ones, of course, as Europeans started exploring the north, is they went out there and whenever they saw a bear, they tried to shoot it. So we're going to pull up an image. This is Horatio Nelson. It's a very famous painting called Nelson and the Bear. So this is Horatio Nelson, who who eventually becomes very famous because this is Nelson of the Battle of Trafalgar. We'd probably be speaking French, all of us, Americans and Canadians, much more so, um, if this guy had been clobbered by this bear. But he saw this bear, wanted to shoot it. He's just a midshipman on, on this ship. This is up near Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic. Um, his old flintlock didn't work. Uh, and, and of course, so he's trying to defend himself from this bear now. It's, uh, it's not sure who's going to come out on top. The neat thing is, if you look at that picture, the cannon is being shot in the background. They were watching what was happening, and this was uh, not a good scenario for their young uh, assistant. And so they uh, blasted the cannon, <laughs> first known polar bear deterrent. So it uh, saved Horatio Nelson, so he lived to die another day. Huh. And then how has it transitioned to even uh, more modern times? So that was the 1800s. Yeah. And then we come forward to the 1900s and now. We've got a lot of polar bear iconic images out there. It point. is, and there's, there's painting after painting of polar bears in, in various images. There's, there's another one, of course, we're in Canada right now, but one of the big things that the Europeans were looking for was the Northwest Passage. Um, and there's a very uh, famous image uh, that uh, it's called Man Proposes and God Disposes. This is what sort of the European society thought happened to the Franklin Expedition. So they were looking for a way to the Orient, across the North, and of course it's a rather grisly scene for those of you uh, who don't know Franklin and all of his, well both of his ships and all of his men disappeared uh, and that resulted in this huge, huge number of people seeking them. Uh, we eventually, just this last year, found one of his ships that sunk in the Arctic. Um, but in this context, this is again this sort of uh, beauty and the beast. I mean, this is a scary animal, you know, you see some bones and ribs there. But it, it's also transcended, um, and if you go to the Dorsey Museum in Paris, you can see a beautiful sculpture. Uh, this is called Lors Blanc, which just means uh, white bear. 
Uh, it's a it's a very sizable statue. It's you know stands as tall as a human. Um, very dramatic, but graceful, and you know it, it's again this stylized sort of Art Deco type of bear, and. You know, you can go anywhere around the world, and I, I tell you, I don't care if it's on a can of pop or a t-shirt or an apron or a tea towel, um, you can find polar bear imagery. Of course, in Canada, we've got them on the back of our $2 coins. I mean, we call them a toonie, but it's, it's got a polar bear on the back side of it. So, you know, they're everywhere. It's just cultures around the world use these sorts of these images all the time. And why? Um, I think there's an, an element, you know, if you look at a lot of cultures, they use eagles, like the United States. It's a sure. very yep. uh, iconic image, and, and it means something. That's, there's a, a strong, free wildness to those animals, and I think people have very much adopted bears as well in that respect. All cultures have. Sure. Um, and and bear in Switzerland has the bear as a symbol for the town, right? Isn't that what bear yeah. means? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you see it everywhere, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, sports teams like crazies, you know, there, there's lots of, you know, I guess we could talk about Chicago Cubs. Chicago and, Cubs, Chicago Bears. Yeah, Boston Bruins, you know, right. so again, it, it sort of goes on and on, and, and it's, it's a major component. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Cassie, the state flag? I was just going to bring that up. The California state flag has a grizzly bear, which is... Um, a little ironic because the grizzly bear has been extirpated from California, yeah. but I believe that one day we will have them back, just like we've in the la last couple of years had our first um, wolves coming back over the border from Oregon into California. So we're keeping that grizzly bear alive on our state flag. So let me ask you, and I know this is kind of away from your range of policy because you've been working on the Arctic and polar bears, but when you have something like that that's so iconic that it's on the state flag, but it's locally extinct or extirpated in that area. Um, how do you work to bring that animal back so that that icon still exists in California? Are there are there laws that you can make for the habitat? What can what can kids and our viewers do to to help bears come back in that context? Well, I think a lot of uh, education and a lot of conservation. So bears. Grizzly bears, they need a lot of wild places. They need a lot of habitat. Sure. And people uh, enjoy that same habitat. Nobody ever goes to a national park and says, gosh, I think we spent too much money saving this national park. Of course not. We love these places. So when we're protecting, um, we're protecting our parks and wild places, we're keeping, um, keeping the habitat so that bears and other wild creatures can can come back there and the, the other thing I think is so interesting about our fascination with bears and other animals is we surround our children with images yeah. of bears and with plush bear toys all of these things it is so um, almost in, intrinsic to who we are and then so sometimes a lot of us lose some of that um, when when we grow up but if we can Hold on to that feeling. I think it really helps with um, with conservation because uh, protecting species, saving the places they live, is incredibly popular with Americans and around the world. Yeah. So maybe leverage those old icons to do modern conservation work. Yes, definitely. And that's actually uh, what was behind. Um, some of our work to uh, list the polar bear under the Endangered Species Act. Back in 2005, we petitioned the American government to protect the polar bears because of the threat of climate change. And I was um, surprised by the number of people who very quickly got involved in that process and really personally connected with it. So when the U.S. government was considering protecting the polar bear, more than three quarters of a million people wrote in many of them school school kids saying please protect this bear we care about the polar bear and it's just so important to us that we don't let this animal go extinct and we do something to save the bear and its arctic habitat and i think a big part of that is this this personal connection that so many of us feel with these bears sure well and another bear that's had kind of a direct impact 
on the habitat is Smokey Bear. So almost everybody knows Smokey the Bear, and the U.S. Forest Service has used Smokey as an icon to prevent forest fires. And um, you know that we've got a lot of fires now, partly due to climate change, partly due to human carelessness. Uh, but Smokey was the representative bear, the representative animal who said, only you can prevent forest fires, and hopefully people are less careless um, because they think about Smokey. Smokey was actually uh, an orphaned black bear, and he was orphaned by a forest fire. They found him in a burnt out tree. Um, apparently he had some burns, you know, on his paws and things like that. But he ended up in Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and where he lived for a number of years. And then I believe there was Smokey Jr. after Smokey the First. Um, but that, that federal icon, that U.S. icon of fighting forest fires was actually um, in National Zoo and pretty happy about that. He didn't die in the forest fire. Um, so Andy, I'm going to turn back to you. We were talking the other day about some of the Inuit carvings and I remember a live bear here at the Tundra Buggy Lodge who was named Dancer and who would arrive around November 1st every year. We think he's, he's passed away now because he was an older male. He would stand up uh, at, the, at the buggies and one year, um, just about the end of Dancer's life, I was going through town and there was an Inuit carving and it really reminded me of Dancer. So personally, I, I purchased that carving and I took it home because it was such a, a strong memory of Dancer. And I know that you also collect some of this Inuit art. Yeah, I do. And, and I mean, there is a, a, a lot of Inuit imagery of, of polar bears uh, in print form, uh, but also in soapstone carving. It, it's pretty common. It's also in ivory from walrus ivory. They, they quite often carve bear heads. It's something we see actually almost across the north, uh, starting from Greenland with Greenland Inuit. Um, and then in the Canadian Arctic and right into Alaska as well. I mean, polar bear uh, make a big impression on people. And there's lots of cultural taboos, not, I mean, not part of that culture, but uh, hunters have told me in the north that all the time, you never, you never joke about polar bears or you never should talk about them. Because on, on one hand, if you talk about the bears and they don't like what you're saying, um, they, they may come and hurt you, come and raid your camp or take your, your seals that you've hunted. Or on the other hand, the bears may not like what you're saying and then the bears won't give their life to you. So you, when you go hunting for polar bears, they won't give themselves up to you. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of these sort of cultural issues that uh, go on in terms of you know cultural understandings and taboos and things that you should and shouldn't do. But polar bears have very, very powerful magic. Um, there's lots of interesting stories in Inuit culture of, of giant bears, like just monstrous bears that would come. Uh, like these would be like, you know, like 20, 30 times the size of a real polar bear. And so you get these sorts of stories and, and it's quite fascinating just the diversity across, across the world. Uh, there's fairy tales in Norway of, uh, of a king bear that um, basically, it's got all the standard things in a, you know, a fairy tale. There's, you know, princesses and gold and this bear that can change form. And, you know, and this, this little princess marries the bear. And, you know, so it goes on and on. But, you know, huh. it's just there's bear stories everywhere. Every yep. single culture has them. And, and it's, uh, it's interesting. And, you know, it transcends all sorts of different aspects of our life. And one of the places that I think is really quite fun is, is in sort of uh, different parts of our culture. And I think we're going to pull up an image. This is from, uh, I think it's called the polar bear polka. Is that what we're going to look at? This is an old piece of music from, you know, there you go, the polar uh. bear polka. I, I've never heard that played. <laughs> now I can imagine I could probably find a good little accordion band somewhere in Minnesota or Alberta or something like that could turn that one into a, a, a new hit, but uh, I, I don't think you're going to find it on iTunes. That's going to be fun. You know, but anyways, you know, that's sort of the sorts of things that you can think of. But, you know, polar bears have been used to sell all sorts of different things. We can pull up an old... Um, I think I got this image from the Library of Congress in the States. It's an old poster uh, that was used for marketing beer. So you've got all these happy bears, you know, drinking beer, fresh and cold. I think it was, it say, straight from the North Pole or something like that. You know, it's, 
it's again, um, you know, why would you choose, I mean, beer, bear, you can sort of see there's a nice little play <laughs> on words there. But again, um, in, in sort of the old sense, I, I'm, I'm kind of fond of, of a good Guinness, right? You know, the beer. And, and again, you know, an, an image, you know, this is a good one for the zoo world, you know. My goodness, my Guinness, you know, here's the bear, he's got his beer, you know. Of course, it's a polar bear and he's drinking his beer. And uh, that, that looks like your typical zookeeper. They're usually upset about something. <laughs> so, you there's, know. And there's actually an entire line of these uh, Guinness posters with animals and zookeepers. There's another whole line of Guinness posters with military people and also with animals in yeah. military gear. Yeah. So animals are iconic and polar bears are just yeah. as iconic as anything else. They definitely fit that mode huh. as well. It's, uh, and, and again, it's, it's, uh, it, it's everywhere. And I think, you know, this is uh, from uh, beer from uh, Japan. And you can see, you know, and this is actually kind of cute because we see polar bears doing this. And I think in the pre-reel leading up to here, you see the polar bears, they just put their front paws flat like that and they just push themselves along the ice. I don't know, it must just feel good or maybe they want a beer, I don't know. But, uh, you know, you sort of see this, this is from Japan. I think this is uh, Sapporo, so from, from the northern parts of Japan. And, and again, it's just kind of an interesting icon that that they use them they're also on the can as well so they they've been used to sell just about everything you know and it's a popular animal at zoos as well and i think we've got a zoo poster um you know you can see from the the uh brookfield zoo no i don't know if they still have polar bears or not there do you know don um you know i'm embarrassed to say i don't remember. I believe that they do right now. Um, that it's a, a good exhibit and that they support polar bear conservation uh, in the wild. But that's a beautiful poster from a while ago. Yeah. Um, I also know that they had the first giant panda in the United States back in the 1930s. So Brookfield's been active in in bears and understanding bears for a long time. Yeah. So that's, it's, that's really cool. It's, it, it's an interesting sort of example, but you know, um, like I said, the first polar bears I ever saw were in a zoo. Um, and I mean, that was the old style zoo and, and certainly the new zoos are doing a much better job with husbandry and keeping the animals entertained. And, and polar bears are bright creatures. So you really, uh, I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of zookeepers and it's really all about keeping them motivated to learn new that's things right. and yep. to keep them uh, you know, seeking out in their environment. So you talk to a lot of zookeepers and how do you keep a polar bear happy? You challenge them, you know, you hide little bits of food in their exhibit so they're hunting around for them. And uh, But I tell you, you know, you come up to Churchill and you see where the bears live. We're in the cages, they're in the wild and, and it's pretty neat uh, to be up here. So there have been some very, very famous zoo polar bears. I think one of the most famous in recent history was Knut. Yeah. Can you talk about that bear? Yeah, this is, uh, we're going to pull up uh, an image. This is Knut, but this is kind of, this is Knut the polar bear, uh, born in a German zoo, which just went, I mean, polar bear cubs are drop dead gorgeous, incredibly cute. But the thing about this is this stamp is actually from Azerbaijan. <laughs> so, you know, that they would put a polar bear on a stamp is, is pretty cool. But it speaks to sort of that draw of this species and, and particularly polar bear cubs. I mean, they're, you know, if I'm giving a talk and I put up a polar bear cub picture, it's always those, oh, sorts of moments, you know, everybody moans and it's, they're just, they're just so sweet. And, and actually, uh, you know, black bear cubs are kind of cute. Um, grizzly bear cubs are, are really cute, but polar bear cubs are just incredibly sweet looking and you know canoe was just a draw from around the world there were fan clubs i mean um the the zoo and the attendance there just went off the charts so it's 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 pretty impressive just the draw of of an animal like that like that one individual yeah well i've got to say i raised a couple of orphaned black bear cubs so i have a little bit of a bias about cute um but yeah polar bear cubs are just as cute um I'd like to go back to, to a book. I think you were talking about it uh, last night. 
And Eric Carl wrote one of my most favorite books ever, which is Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? And I think there's a white bear in there as well. Yeah, there's, there's a book. I don't think we have it, but it's uh, Polar Bear, Polar Bear, What Do You Hear is what it's called. And again, yeah. it's, it's, you know, we see this in books and films. Uh, polar bears just show up all the time. It, it's just, it's, I, I defy you to find somebody in North America and probably Europe that doesn't have at least or haven't read at least one children's polar bear book to their kids. You know, Little Polar Bear is kind of a whole classic series, this little polar bear that drifts around and has all these adventures. And it's just, uh, there's just no shortage of interest. Um, and I think children relate to polar bears. For some reason, they're drawn to this animal. They're intrigued by them. And, you know, of course, we sort of make them more human than they really are. Uh, but kids, kids love polar bears. And, you know, you can find polar bears and all sorts of things, children's games, for example. And, you know, if anybody's, you know, really bored and Saturday night's coming up, you know, you can try to find a, your own game of polar bear bingo. And I have actually never played <laughs> polar bear bingo. <laughs> But, you know, it's curious. Yeah, I, I've never seen, you know, like a golden retriever bingo. Um, I've never seen, you know, I don't know. It, it, it just draws you in. I mean, I bet you if you made Polar Bear Monopoly, <laughs> people would buy it. I mean, it. you know, there's actually, there's a marketing there's a market. idea. <laughs> you know, so, so again, you get down to it. Uh, people just love polar bears. And, you know, you don't see walrus bingo. Why is that, you know? Astounding. Well, we've got, um, <laughs> I think we've got some weird images over there. Um, we just have a note coming in, and I'd like to just clarify, of course, Brookfield has polar bears. They're an Arctic ambassador center with Polar Bears International. Um, I knew that. <laughs> I, I thought that, but of course I wasn't doing my uh, pre-talk fact checking. Um, okay, so a couple of more uh, images here. I, I thought I saw an, an image flash by that... Uh, that polar bear with a guy dancing near a car. So sometimes we think of these icons as very, very friendly bears because, again, they're on two legs. They have forward-facing eyes. So why should they act like, uh, you know, the wolf that for some reason got a really bad reputation early on and the bear not so much? But um, despite the fact that this polar bear looks like it's hugging the guy. Maybe you could talk about how bears aren't really all that cute in nature. Well, Again. we can start with this. If you if you have not seen this, this is for a Nissan Leaf, and I'm not, not I don't get any funding from them, but you can, it was an electric car. So I so, thought this was a Nissan Leaf ad too, but doesn't that look like a Toyota in maybe, the image? Maybe somebody switched it. I remember the Nissan Leaf. Maybe, maybe somebody uh, doctored this I, one. Anyways, <laughs> but if you if you want to see this, it you can go online. I think it's a Nissan Leaf that the ad is for, and and uh, but you can see how this this ad is made, and it actually is a, a captive raised polar bear that lives on the west coast in in Canada. Polar bears are extremely easy to train, um, and and so they train this polar bear, and they show you there's. The bear actually just stands up and they put computer images together to make this all work. Uh, but again, polar bears are being sort of used as a symbol of, of uh, climate change and they are used by both industry and conservation groups uh, and to sort of bring the message of climate change home to people. Um, but again, it, it comes down to this sort of image of, of this pure animal, but people also relate to it from the perspective of climate change. Sure. Well, so uh, I, I'd like to talk about a couple of images that we were looking at this morning. We don't have them, but there's a brown bear who's apparently painting in Finland. So he's in his own enclosure, and then they bring in the canvas, they bring in the paints, and he paints with his owner. And again, brown bears apparently very, very trainable. I don't go in with brown bears. I don't know anybody who does. You know, there's uh, the old... Um, TV show of kind of gentle band. There was a book way back when called The Biggest Bear. Those were all brown bears and brown bears kind of working with people and hanging around with people. So kind of the bear as an icon as our friends, even Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, they don't 
eat her. They just kind of chase her away. Or in some stories of Goldilocks, she actually takes over the house. Yep. And then we've got Br'er Bear, who in American folklore, who's kind of a stumbling around dumb bear, and the skunk beats Br'er Bear and his family, and the bunny, Br'er Rabbit beats Br'er Bear and his, uh, but they're they're not that friendly out in the wild, right? Well, you know, it's bears are everywhere. Here. I mean, Homer Simpson hangs <laughs> out with a polar bear. I think that was in the Homer Simpson movie. You know, um, it's kind of a, a, a fun story. Um, you know, it, it they're just everywhere. Of course, Homer survives. I mean, nothing can kill Homer. But you know, you get that idea <laughs> that you know why why would you put a polar bear with Homer Simpson? You know, it, it's kind of funny that way. But you know, they they pervade all aspects of of. Of our life, and and you know, it's. I think that's one of the reasons why people so much relate to the idea of trying to address the problem of climate change. I mean, we're focusing on polar bears because so we're up here with Polar Bears International, but of course, it, it's really about much more than polar bears, and in, in the longer term. Hmm. Uh, we have a question here from Annie that says, "Are there any new movies coming out soon about polar bears?" We know about uh, Arctic Tale in 2007 and To the Arctic in 2012. Um, you had mentioned a story from Norway, and it sounds like that fed into the Golden Compass tale somehow. Yeah, the Golden Compass, of course, uses polar bears uh, a lot. I mean, as it's, warriors, it, it, as right. warriors, are sort of this big, you know, and they ride around on them, and they're all dressed up in armor. So it's again, it's 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 a very majestic animal, and so I think people relate to that, and and it just sort of really brings home this sort of northern mystique um, right. of, of these animals as well. But there is a new polar bear movie coming out, and I can't remember what it's called. It's kind of a bit of a goofy bear. It's about a polar bear again, I and mean, it's one of these sort of animated movies. I haven't really confessed that I've followed huh. it too closely. I mean, the and IMAX... I think the Jungle Book is coming out. Right? Well, the Jungle Book is coming out. That's going to be a grizzly bear. It uh, looks like that's how Baloo's going to be portrayed in that one. So, right. um, yeah. It's and, and by the way, to all of our viewers, I looked up the Jungle Book last night, and in Rudyard Kipling's original writing, he talked about how the bear was brown, now sloth bears are black, not really brown, and so are Asiatic black bears black, and then there's an Asiatic brown bear that would be brown. He also talked in like a second or third edition about how Baloo was walking around eating nuts and berries like any good bear. Well, a sloth bear is a, kind of an obligate insectivore. They've got these long kind of vacuum snouts and they eat ants and they eat termites and things like that. So maybe Kipling meant for him to be a brown bear originally. I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. There's, there's several species of bears over there. It could be a sloth, it could be Asiatic black, or it could be a grizzly bear. I mean, I guess I always thought it was a sloth bear because they're kind of the ones you'd find in the jungle, you know, you know, hanging out where actually tigers live. Um, um, brown bears or grizzly bears in that part of the world actually don't hang out in the jungles. They're much further north, up in the mountains, sort of up in uh, the far north. So. You know, there's a little bit of artistic license in all of those sorts of right. stories, I think. Um, we have a question from Fenster3. And Cassie, I'm going to toss this one to you because you do work over in California and you know probably more about this than I do. But has smoky bear or wildfire suppression done more harm or good? Mm -hmm. That <laughs> is a terrific question. That is a really good question. Thank you for asking that one. And um, uh, fires in the forest actually play an important role in the ecosystem. And the biggest problems we get is when we have people living right on the edge of wild, wild areas and other areas that are really, really susceptible to big fires. And then you have, um, of course, a really big safety threat. So we do have to keep our communities safe, of course. But we also need to manage our forests in a way that protects all the plants and animals living there. And sometimes uh, projects that are billed as forest suppression are actually not good 
for the ecosystem, sometimes they can just be an excuse for more logging. So we have to scrutinize each project very carefully to see if it's really doing a good job keeping people safe and also protecting that habitat. So thanks for that really careful thinking on that one. Hmm. That's a great answer. Thanks. And we have one from Jesse Russell. What's the best account of polar bears, either in fiction or nonfiction? Maybe besides Dr. DeRoche's book. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> jeepers. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I would make 70 cents, Jesse, if you bought a copy of my book. So um, I, could, I could buy a quarter of a cup of coffee. Um, it's, it's uh, I mean, actually, my book is pretty good. It's actually pretty readable. It's, it's pretty cheap as well, as far as books go. Amazon.com has it for like 27 bucks or something. Um, there's another book by written by Ian Sterling, who was um, uh, is still very active in polar bears and polar bear research. He's retired for a number of years now, um, but he's kind of considered the godfather of polar bear research and has been doing it uh, for a number of years longer than I have. Uh, he was actually my doctoral supervisor. Uh, Ian's book is really good. Um, there are so many books written. Uh, I, I kind of like On Thin Ice by Richard Ellis. He's a, a very good uh, sort of general overview. Uh, of course, he interviews me a lot in that. But and, and So his book is really nice. It's a few years older. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there that I think is a little bit more marginal. But, but I think I would go look at uh, Richard Ellis's book. That would be a nice overview, at least of the threats facing polar bears. Um, there are older books out there. Some of them have what I would say is a little bit of um, uh, folk, more for folklore than science. But from a from a fictional perspective, I can't really think that I've ever read a book that's kind of you know you know. There's all sorts of really weird things with bears and you know clan of the cave bear and things, but yeah. that's not polar bears. Um, I don't really know of anything that I'd really. Um, that I've ever read, sort of fictional accounts. I'd have to vote for, for uh, the Golden Compass. Yeah, the Golden Compass kind of works. It's it's way out there. It's you know in in terms of fiction for sure. But yeah, it's actually it, it's kind of a good story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to look at my friend Elisa and ask if we can have the slide on the uh, polar bear team's shoutouts. So. We're going to show a slide of the current Project Polar Bear teams and, and advisors and give a big shout out to people around the world right now. Um, we have teams from the United States, um, high New York City, uh, from Spain, from Hungary, from India, from Canada, high Toronto, and uh, so we want to give them a big shout out. Can we'll we do that? We'll get it up here in a second. Um, uh, and I, while we're doing that, I'd like to pass along a comment from Carol Lung, who said, you know, the press made a sentimental and actually false story out of that uh, Teddy Roosevelt and hunting party thing. I won't go into the details there, but um, except to say that she appreciates Teddy's enormous contribution to our environmental heritage and uh, that he was a hunter and quite used to killing and using the bodies of animals and yes he was and uh, I know that we have some of his specimens from the Roosevelt expeditions in the Smithsonian. Uh, we also have Roosevelt museums around the United States and he donated specimens to those museums and and all of those museums continue to do important conservation work and of course TR was uh, one of my favorite conservationists. So did that work for us, Alisa? Yeah. <laughs> okay, here well. we go. Thank you very <laughs> much for getting that up and on. Um, so we'd like to just give a big shout out to all these folks who are current Project Polar Bear teams. Um, I think, so let's talk about things that don't have images attached, but where maybe just the names are attached. I. Uh, took an opportunity to take a swim on New Year's Day in the North Atlantic and those swims are called polar bear plunges and most of them raise money for one organization or, or another. What other kind of polar bear namings do you know about? I know of uh, bike rides uh, for sure. 
that that are tied to polar bears, uh, and and those are used as fundraisers as well. Um, but that's probably the major one. I mean, the polar bear swims. I mean, you just go across the world, and there's there's polar bear swims almost everywhere. So right. it, that's a classic. I don't know. I, they must have one in Churchill, but I don't know if they actually do. That'd be a good question. If not, huh. we could probably start one. Mind you, uh, pretty darn cold water for for right. swimming in, in in the springtime. So it's um, it it's it's really a, a an interesting sort of area. But these polar bear swims, I've never done one. I have no interest in it, to tell you the truth. But well, I hear I, I don't like. Really I, I work on polar bears, and I hate being cold. So <laughs> that that's one of the problems. We, I think, in New York City, off of Coney Island, we had six hundred people. We were doing a fundraiser for uh, the fire department and their their summer camps for underprivileged youth, and uh, it's pretty difficult. They have lifesavers in the water because the water is so cold that you know if you're not in good shape, you might have. A heart attack because it's yeah. so cold. So, but here, swimming in cold water might be a little different because there might actually be a polar bear on the beach somewhere, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty funny. Well, um, I'm getting the high sign that we have to wrap up. So I'm going to ask Cassie for some some advice about how we can all contribute to the future of bears and polar bears specifically in our lives. Sure, get involved. Uh, to help solve the biggest threat that polar bears have ever faced, which is, of course, climate change. We're going to be talking uh, more in more detail in a couple hours about the upcoming Paris climate talks, but you can get involved. Um, good, one good website is 350.org to um, find out how you can get involved um, in a march or other action that's going to be happening the last weekend of November, right before. Um, the Paris Climate Talks happen and get involved in whatever way um, most works for you to help solve this problem, cutting your own carbon footprint, getting involved in the school or workplace, or asking your elected officials um, to take stronger action to reduce greenhouse pollution now. That's great. Andy, any comments? Well, I, I think the big one is, is get informed. Understand the issues and the science behind climate change. It's not complicated, but there's a lot of disinformation out there. Um, and once you have the basic understanding of what climate change is really all about, uh, it's the next step is actually to, to move towards voting with your um, conscience and knowing what's the right thing to do. It's not necessarily for the people that are alive today, maybe your kids or grandchildren will face the problems. This is really about intergenerational fairness and that's the way I view it. Uh, I always tell my undergraduates when I'm teaching at the university, I'm going to be fertilizer by the time you're paying the real <laughs> costs of our lack of action. Um, and of course polar bears are just telling us that there's something going on. Um, but once we get to the issues of, of the um, challenges for future generations, we're not going to be very concerned about polar bears. We're going to be worried about where our water is coming from, where is our food coming from, what do we do with millions upon millions of displaced people um, that just can't live where they used to live. So it's, it, the bears are telling us we have a chance and if we pay attention um, and we can we can act we can act now and I think the the next uh, meetings in Paris are uh, a great opportunity it's nice to see a new government in Canada that's taking this seriously for the first time in the last 10 years uh, uh, Canada has been a laggard in this area and it's we're I'm very hopeful brand new environment minister um, to deal with this under the uh, new Trudeau government and I'm really looking forward to a different attitude coming from Canada. Um, so it would be nice if both Canada and the US and Europe and the rest of the world is all on the same page in Paris this uh, coming autumn. Great, thanks. Well, bears are found around the world and we certainly want to keep them in the world. Polar Bears International main mission is to keep polar bears in the Arctic always and it's important to remember that we have the time and resources to save them. You can do your part. You can turn the, the temperature down at home in the wintertime and just put a sweater on. You can let it go up in the summertime and not use so much air conditioning, but 
you know, try to try to save bears. You can do your part. Thanks for all the things that you're already doing to reduce your carbon footprint, and I hope you continue to join us this Polar Bear Week. We go November 1st through the 7th, and we'll have webcasts every day. You can take the next step for polar bears by pledging to save more energy, like I just talked about, and asking family and friends to join you. You can find suggestions on the Polar Bears International website. And don't forget to tell us what you're doing through social media. Also, check out our iTunes U channel on the website for curriculum and resources for teachers and students. And please take our post-broadcast survey, which helps us to improve our programming. And participants in that will be entered to draw in a draw to win a free polar bear adoption. So keep polar bears in your heart and in your heads, and please do what you can for the Arctic and for the creatures here. And yes, I like black bears, brown bears, panda bears, spectacled bears, sloth bears, and all the other bears of the world also. But polar bears are big, they're icons, and they're my favorite, and I guess they're our favorites. So from the Arctic, Bye for now. Thanks for joining us. Take care, folks.